Amen. All right, we are on um, at long last Hebrews 8. Um, so uh, thank you uh, for um, your patience in the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, for those of you who were there who um, still had power slash internet, I know that that was the one night that the Moody household didn't. Um, we, uh, we looked at uh, Jeremiah and a passage from Jeremiah, which is quoted at length in Hebrews 8. So if you were there, my hope is that that would be, you know, a help as we in, uh, deal with this chapter. But if you weren't there, I'm hoping that it's not going to be a requirement. Um, so one of those nice to have. Um, last week, uh, we, we had a time of fellowship and prayer together for those who, who wanted to be there. So finally, we're, we're getting into Hebrews chapter 8. So as you're uh, getting your Bibles open to, to Hebrews 8, um, I wanted to at least uh, prime the pump a little bit and uh, talk a little bit about what I want us to be looking for in this chapter, because um, this, this chapter is sort of a transitional chapter. It's going from the argument that uh, the, the, the preacher is making in chapter seven about Melchizedek and Jesus and this high priest thing. And now he begins to pivot and talk a little bit about the covenant um, and about uh, the way of doing things under the old covenant and the ministry uh, under the old covenant uh, so that he can uh, launch into a larger discussion on that in chapter nine. Um, so because of that, I want to uh, just, just give us a little hint as to what we're going to be looking at. So let me share my screen with you. Uh, we'll, we'll go through this little exercise, and then we'll read the passage together. All right. So uh, Hebrews chapter 8 is uh, one of the key words that we'll be looking for is shadow or um, like something that that isn't fully real, something that is a representation. Um, and we'll be we'll be talking more about that in a minute here. Um, but uh, I want to first uh, I've got a few pictures for you. Uh, and um, by show of hands, I'm going to ask you uh, if the picture is of a real kitchen or if it's of a play kitchen, okay? Uh, uh, there's, there's a method to the madness here, I promise. So this first picture, uh, uh, if, you if you think that this is a real kitchen, go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, okay. How about all of you who think it's a play kitchen? Go ahead and raise your hand. Oh, very good, very good. Yes, this is a play kitchen. Um, it's a, a play kitchen that is a little bit fancier than one that Elizabeth has. We have a little stove top for her. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, you can definitely tell that although they try to make it real, they've got a little pot there. Um, not quite, not quite real. Okay, this kitchen. Uh, go ahead and raise your hand if you think this is a real kitchen. Mm -hmm. Got a lot of hands. We got some thinking, folks. Play kitchen, anybody? No way anybody's ever cooked anything in that kitchen. <laughs> a fair point, John. Yeah, no kitchen is ever that. Looks spotless. like a store model. <laughs> this is magazine what layout. So I, I put into the Google kitchen remodel, and this is <laughs> this is the image that popped up. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, probably a play kitchen, even though it is a real kitchen. Okay. What about this kitchen? Real kitchen? Play kitchen. Play kitchen. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, and uh, yeah, you know, the, the little person who looks like she's working real hard there, you know, it kind of gives it away with the, with the bear or the little dolly in the backpack, <laughs> the bare feet. Um, Again, very similar to, to that, that first kitchen that we saw. Okay, we got two more. Play kitchen. And real kitchen. Yeah, yeah, this is a real kitchen. And, and this, is, uh, this is not what the Moody Kitchen looks like every night, um, uh, but, but that's okay <laughs> because we can't eat that much. <laughs> on, on Thanksgiving, the Moody Kitchen looks kind of like this um, because uh, you, you should, if you've not tried Kate Moody's stuffing, something you need to try before you die. 
Okay, last one here. Um, this one is, is maybe my favorite picture. Uh, real kitchen? Nope. Play kitchen? But you know, it does have real working lights. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, no, no, absolutely. And, and you got all these right. And this is kind of a silly thing uh, to do because of course, some of these are, are real and some of these are, are play and it's pretty obvious which is which. Um, one of the things that uh, we're gonna see in, in this chapter of the book of Hebrews, like I, like I mentioned a little bit ago, it talks a lot about um, a, a shadow or a representation of what's in heaven. And I think that so frequently uh, what little kids do is a shadow or a representation of what adults do. And um, some of us are seeing this more up close and personally right now than others. Um, but uh, uh, you, many of you have seen this, whether in your household or in you know, uh, other folks' households, you've seen uh, how kids imitate and how kids play pretend, and how kids learn by doing, you know, kind of a scale model of. A couple examples. So one of the things that Elizabeth loves to make in her kitchen is, is she'll sometimes bring daddy a little cheeseburger. And, you know, there's there's no question, this is not a, a, you know, bacon and guacamole cheese. There's a difference here. But the thought is what counts and and she's you know putting together something for for mommy or for daddy and and, and bringing it to us and you know same thing I, no matter how skilled my daughter is and i will sing her praises she's not going to paint the mona lisa um but you know i'll be darned we have this picture that she drew sitting you know i, I just the same way we'd frame it on 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 the you know kitchen door because it's adorable. She, she brought a picture like this home from daycare. She's done this a couple times and said, look, it's you, daddy, or look, it's you, mommy. And um, under no objective sense, is this a good picture? I mean, <laughs> it, has, it has the head, <laughs> it has the big eyes, um, but, it's a but it's so good yeah. um, because of, of the intent behind it. This is what I want you to keep in your mind as we read Hebrews 8. Um, I want you to look for things that are real versus things that are symbolic, a representation, or a shadow. Not because the things that are a shadow aren't real, but because the things that are a shadow are intentionally representing something that is even greater. Something that that you know uh, is 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 so much greater than we could even imagine. So just as precious as the drawings and the food that's made by a little person is, um, that's the same sort of mindset that I think is going on between God and the old covenant. Okay, so keep that in your minds as we read. Any questions about that so far before we get into the scripture? Excellent. Good. Well, um, let's read Hebrews chapter eight. Uh, we are going to have two readers. Hebrews eight is not long. It is 13 verses. So I'd like one reader to read Hebrews eight, one through seven, and then the second reader to read verse eight through verse 13. Who'd like to read one through seven? Thank you, Emily Clark. Uh, who'd like to read eight through 13? Thank you, Steve Walker. Um, I won't uh, get in between y'all. So as soon as Emily's done, Steve, you can go ahead and pick up where she left off. Go ahead and let us know what translation you're reading from as well. That's uh, it. NIV. Something like that. Yeah, app, app, application study Bible. Um, starting the, the point of what we are saying is this. We do have such a high priest who sat down at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven and who serves in the sanctuary, the true tabernacle set up by the Lord, not by man. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. 
And so it is necessary for this one also to have something to offer. If he were on earth, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. They serve at the sanctuary that is a copy and shadow of what is in heaven. This is why Moses was warned when he was about to build the tabernacle. See to it that you make everything according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But the ministry Jesus has received is as superior to theirs as the covenant of which he is a mediator, is superior to the old one, and is founded on better promises. I'm reading from the Apologetic Study Bible. For if that first covenant has been faultless, no opportunity would have been sought for a second one. But finding fault with his people, he says, Look, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day I took them by their hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant, I disregarded them, says the Lord. <clears throat> but this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts and I will be their God and they will be my people. And each person will not touch, will not teach his fellow citizen and each his brother saying, know the Lord, because they will all know me from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful in their wrongdoing and I will never again remember their sins. By saying a new covenant, he has declared that the first is old, and what is old and aging is about to disappear. Very good. Thank you, Steve. <clears throat> Thank you, Emily. Um, I want to give you all a little bit of, of time to, to digest some of what we read. Um, and, and some of you may uh, digest a little quicker, and that's fine. And so if you have a question, you can, you can jump up and ask it, metaphorically speaking. Um, don't need to jump up. Uh, but if nobody has a question, I want to return to something that Emily Hobby uh, mentioned a couple of weeks ago when we were discussing this. So uh, I'm, I'm opening the floor for a second if there is a need to digest anything or a need to, to process stuff together. And then we'll go to what Emily Hobby asked about knowing the Lord. All right, I'm not seeing anybody jump up, and that's okay. Um, as you're as you're thinking through this and, and processing through this, I want to. Uh, remind you, um, a couple weeks ago, it feels like a lifetime ago, um, so uh, no worries if you don't remember, uh, but Emily Hobby had, had mentioned that there are some Christian sects, I think you were saying, and maybe I'm putting that word in your mouth, so, so correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, well, who, uh, uh, it's a, 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 fr uh, a more fu fundamentalist approach. I wouldn't say they're a sect, but sure. it, just a uh, uh, some people with a more fundamentalist philosophy than Presbyterians. Yeah, yeah. So say say a little bit more about what you've experienced with this idea of knowing the Lord, right? Or what they've how they've represented it. Well, it seems to be thrown out as a challenge all the time and a concern. Does this person know the Lord? Well, how do I? How can I judge if this? You know, we. You know, we, someone. If someone is ill, and we've prayed for this person together, and then she goes, "Well, what do you think? Does this person know the Lord? Are they going to be saved?" <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. I just. I don't go there. I, it's all in God's hands in my mind. But she's constantly doing this, not just with me in conversation, but with other friends too. It's it's a it's a challenge. Do you know the Lord? Well, we all maybe we all know the Lord in our own way. I think. Right. You know, I, I've been I've been thinking about this on and off for the last couple of weeks, ever since you asked it. And what I keep coming back to, and this is not, you know, the, the, the end all be all answer by any means, but what I keep coming back to is it matters a whole heck of a lot less whether I know the Lord as to whether the Lord knows me. 
um, that matters a whole lot more, um, I think, uh, because I will try, right? I will, I will try my darndest to know the Lord. And, um, you know, it may very well be that, um, you know, I know the Lord, say, this much, right? That if I were to try and describe the Lord and draw the Lord, you know, <laughs> here's, uh, on, on the one hand, right, here's um, what God may, you know, actually, you know, <laughs> look like, and then, you know, here's my drawing. Do I know the Lord? Well, you know, not according to this, but, um, but that's not the question, right? That's not what's important. What's important is the, that maybe, maybe I get some things wrong, um, but I know that I am loved by the Lord. I don't know that that answers your question, Emily, and I'd love to throw the doors open for anybody I else, just, too. I, I caught as we were reading tonight when, let's see, which first I can focus the bifocals here. In verse 11, uh, it says, and they shall not teach everyone his fellow or everyone his brother saying, know the Lord, for all shall know me. So maybe, you know, that's a, that's a good verse. <laughs> that, could, yeah. well, that could be an answer for her. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's reassuring that God, I mean, the, the Psalm says he knows the hairs on our head. Right. You're absolutely right. What other thoughts thank are you. there on this idea? Absolutely. Thank you for, for the question. What other ideas are this? Or what other thoughts do y'all have on this idea of knowing the Lord? Dave, yeah, and then Jim Henry. Just a, just a quick thought. Uh, it, it seems like with the old covenant, that knowing the, the Lord was uh, communal. It was it was a community type thing. It was a really, really the Hebrew people. But with the new covenant, it's personal. It's each one of us knowing the Lord, not as a, as a group or as a, uh, but does that make any sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think so. That, that, and, and yeah, I think that's kind of what verse 11 is, is saying, I think, is that, that we will know the Lord, not just as a corporate group, but we, you and I, all of right. us, each one of us. That the Holy Spirit will take up residence, not just among us, right, in the cloud of, of and, and the fire, but in our individual hearts. Yeah, right. That's a very preceding verses talk about that well, he doesn't want just written on a stone tablet he wants it written on our minds and on our hearts so it's it's an individual personal approach rather than a corporate approach that's oh, what i can do that but. i think that, but dave said no written in your heart i mean if you substitute no or uh, love for no then it may you know makes a little more sense to me anyway i mean I don't know how you can know the Lord. I mean, you can't, you're not even supposed to look at him. I mean, like Moses, you know, whatever. <laughs> right, right. It reminds me of some of what Paul says. We're going to go to Jim in a second, but uh, uh, that, that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up, right? That now we see through a mirror dimly, then we will see face to face. Um, now, then we will know fully, even as we are fully known, is what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 13. Go ahead, Jim. Well, I have, and this, this may be a stupid question on my part, so tell me if it is. I, I'm, I, I have a question about the universe, I don't know how to say the word, universality of this statement uh -huh. where everyone will know the Lord. It yeah. starts off by saying this new covenant is between the people of Israel and Judah. Well, there's more to the world than that at that point. So is this somehow a limited knowledge? And maybe does this really apply to us today mm -hmm. that everybody knows the Lord? Or was it a limited thing? And we still have a obligation and there may be some people that don't know the Lord because is this new covenant with the world or is it with just right. this group of people? It's a great I, question. Well, maybe Jim. a dumb question, but I, I, I'm trying to understand who the new covenant is with mm -hmm. and, and does this statement of everybody knows the Lord, 
does that apply to present day America, South America, you know, that type thing? Yeah, that is the opposite of a dumb question, Jim. No, that's good. Uh, that's careful reading. And I see Bunny has her hand up and she may want to respond to this. I saw Sarah unmute uh, and she may want to respond to this as well. And Steve, you may still be unmuted from reading and that's fine. Um, but if you want to respond, then, then we can go up to you also. Go ahead, Bunny. Uh, I was just thinking that you've got the vine and that's Israel and that's is you know what's mentioned here but we're grafted on so we're part of that same vine so yes we're part of it and everybody can be grafted mm -hmm. thank you bunny uh, very good hearkening uh, back to that romans 11 uh, idea of, of paul saying that we've grafted on go ahead sarah Actually, I'm stepping back a little bit about the knowing God. And what came to my mind was the instruction to try things, to know, to know whether things are, are, are from God by having tried, tested them and recognizing them. So, um, and I think some of that knowledge has to be both from, from the mind and the heart. Yeah. That's, that's really important uh, to note that God's not just interested in your mind, excuse me, your mind. God's not just interested in your heart. God wants your entire being, you know, your thoughts and your feelings, your strength and your soul. Um, go ahead, Gloria D. I, I was thinking of the way, and I'm thinking that Perhaps we can never really know God because, you know, but just the process of getting to know him is, for me, what's important. Uh, yeah. I get to know God when I get to heaven. <laughs> but right, right, right now, I'm just, it, and it, that's what keeps us going, I think. Absolutely. And that's why there's the idea of faith, right? Mm -hmm. Is that it, it, God cannot be fully known uh, mm -hmm. But but we can know things, and there are things that are true about God. We can know absolutely here. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, God is is so far beyond us that that we can't fully know, but we can mm -hmm. begin to know. That's mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say, maybe a little yeah. bit. Yeah. Um, well, uh, yeah. Let's let's go to Steve, and I want to I want to name also uh, uh, getting back to Jim's question: Is this new covenant for us? Uh, I, I don't want that to, to, to be left by the wayside. And Steve, if, you, if, if you're not going to comment on that, that's fine. Um, we, can, we can add to, to the things. Uh, you can go I, 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 I'm just wrestling with a thought, Joel. And maybe you can help with clarification on this. Because in, the, in this passage that we, I, I just read, and it says, where it says, the Lord says, I will put my laws in their minds. I'll write them in their hearts and I will be their God. And so my question is, this is my wondering, is I think about people maybe in Africa who have no idea about Christianity. I mean, are, are they, are, are God's words in their hearts? Because I think part of that's in, humanity of you know if if um, I would would think if someone saw a baby laying in a ditch no matter who they are they would say you know I need I need to care for that child mm -hmm. and and or you know I, you know there's there's no reason or rhyme rhyme or reason for why people become murderers or anything else but i i just wonder you know about those that really don't profess a faith do they have god's words on their hearts and that's kind of my thing i want to put out there because i wrestle with that sometimes is how, how yeah well there's an answer for that or not 
-hmm. yeah and 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 it's it, both you know steve you and jim uh, i i mean there have been a number of good questions already in just the you know few minutes we've been together but both of those are really heavy questions how do we as people who are not of israel and judah fit into this new covenant and what do we do about the fact that there are some who will never hear the gospel um how do we deal with that hey I, that's that's what i heard a little bit in your question anyway steve um okay great i'm not misrepresenting you then wonderful well let's um let's let's see if we can tackle one or both of these go ahead emily I, I wrestle with that as well, because I remember as a young woman, uh, this uh, Baptist preacher came to my house and basically told me that a holy person like Mahatma Gandhi was go not going to get to heaven. And I can't tell you how quickly I booted that man out of my house. <laughs> so I've struggled with this for a long time. Uh, by the way, uh, today is Bob's birthday, in case you didn't know. Thank you. Happy birthday. Um, I, yeah, to, to figure out, right? Jesus, on the one hand, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And on the other hand, we know that there are people who, uh, and this is getting, for those of you who are in the, um, the uh, Matthew Bible study, we talked a little bit about this, I think, um, in, in Bible study on Sunday. We, were, we hit on Matthew 25, uh, verses 31 through 46, which many of you have heard several times in the last couple of years um, about how Jesus will, will say to folks at the end of time, you know, basically what you've done for the least of these you've done for me. Um, and so there's, there's this idea, right, that we have a set of beliefs that are going to inform what we do, but the set of beliefs that inform what we do may not be exactly what we think we believe. You with me so far? <laughs> This, this, I, I, this is as, as complicated as I think I can make this. So I'm sorry, I should try and simplify this a little bit more. Um, but I may think that I believe in God. But if someone were to watch me without knowing what I think I believe, what would that person conclude about my life? Um, and if that person conc would conclude about my life, well, that, that guy doesn't believe in God at all. That guy just wants to, you know, uh, make sure that, that whatever, like, like make sure that, that he's important, right? Or that he, you know, gets X, Y, and Z. Then maybe I don't actually believe. Maybe my actions don't reflect what I think I believe. Mahatma Gandhi, someone whose actions I think reflected a deep faith and trust in Jesus Christ, even if he would not have said that he believed and trusted in Jesus Christ. Um, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of directions we can go here. I appreciate Bunny what you put in the chat that there are some three thousand unreached people groups in the world, and you learned that at a missionary conference one and a half years ago. If uh, if you worship with us this Sunday, you're going to hear a story um, about two missionaries, uh, uh, Jim and Elizabeth Elliot. And some of you may may be aware of the work that Jim and Elizabeth Elliot did. Um, I won't say any more, but it's uh, it's it's an important story uh, to think about as we think about what it means to to reach others with with our faith. Which gets at I think Jim's question. Um, Kate, go ahead. Did you want to jump in on Jim's question? Um, you can finish what you were saying first. Okay. Um, uh, Jim's question being uh, the, whether this covenant that God is making has anything to do with us. Um, all the way back when God covenanted with Abraham, saying, I will bless you, and through you, all nations will be blessed. That's the covenant that uh, is, is being talked about in Jeremiah. That's the covenant that was initiated in Jesus Christ. Um, that this new covenant with Israel and with Judah is the covenant of Jesus, that Jesus as a descendant of Judah, 
as an Israelite man himself, would carve this covenant in his own body um, so that all may be open to knowing the Lord. Uh, that's that's my two cents on that anyway, Jim. Um, go now, ahead. That, and, and then the we'll the only keep. question I, I still have remaining a little bit, excuse me, is um, where it says everyone will know the Lord. Mm -hmm. the 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 does that apply to the three thousand people group that are not reached do they know the lord and if so how right. is it just ingrained in everybody and in, in every person that inhabits the earth is it ingrained somewhere in their body that they know it it's just not come out yet or you see what i'm saying I, I, that's yeah. the part that gets me about everybody knows you know he's saying everybody knows he's the lord and you don't have to teach him anything well yeah right it doesn't make a lot of sense uh, if, it, if it applies to everybody it, I, we're not supposed to teach our neighbors or our friends i don't understand that right no i hear that jim um and and that's that's a fair question uh, as well um who is the they right they shall not teach one another or say to each other know the lord um let me, let me pull us back for just a second, because I think that that's an interesting question. That's a question that we could play with, um, that, that we could wrestle with, and we should. And I think that the more pertinent question, uh, getting back to something that, that Emily's friend asked her, um, is, is in what ways do you know the Lord? And in what ways does the Lord know you? And if someone were to ask you, well, who is your Lord and Savior? This is one of the things that, um, that we ask our confirmands. Uh, who is your Lord and Savior? Well, what we ought to be able to answer is Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. And I may not know him as well as I ought to, but darn it, I am trying to learn more. Because um, there's, there's a song, maybe you've heard of it, um, uh, it's called knowing you it goes knowing you jesus knowing you there is no greater thing you're my all you're the best you're my joy my righteousness and i love you lord are the lyrics uh and, and that's in some ways the theme song of the christian life there is no greater thing than to learn about who christ is and so it's interesting and we do need to ask ourselves what our god would do uh, to the, the person who's never heard of him, to the 3,000 people groups? I think that's, that's an important question for us to ask ourselves. But an even more important question to ask is, uh, what are you doing with, with your life? How are you knowing the Lord? And how are you learning more about God? Not because, you know, uh, you're going to go to hell if you don't know enough about God. That's not the purpose here. But because it's cool, God is really neat to learn about because the more you learn about God, the more you see how wonderful God is. I'm going to get off my soapbox for a second. Um, Kate, you've been waiting. Thank you. Yeah, I, I uh, appreciate hearing everyone's question, questions. To me, these deeper questions are related to one another. And whenever I am looking at a text, in the Bible that confuses me. I, I, I remember a person who taught a Bible study class when I was in high school. And he would often say that we should always take like the individual passage and put it in context of the entire Bible, right? So I have a question about, is this covenant for us? Okay, if, I, if this passage doesn't make it clear to me, then what does the rest of the Bible say? And, um, and so that to, to me, like that reminds me that the audience of this book is the Hebrew people. And so the, the author is choosing passages from the Hebrew scriptures to make a case for the new covenant that was prophesied um, long ago. And so I'm not sure that the audience who were initially reading this book would have been asking the questions that we're asking of it, like, because to them, it you know, the new covenant would definitely have um, applied to them. And so I'm not sure if this is the passage that best answers that question um, because of that. Um, the other piece um, 
similar, like if I look at the whole Bible and what I know and believe about God, I know that God is the perfect judge. And so, you know, when I ask myself, well, does someone know God? Will they be saved? It's a, it's a huge relief to me to know that God is the perfect judge of that person. I don't have to have a methodology to say yes or no, they are saved or not. Um, and I, I, I bet that not everyone on this call can follow me this way, but to me, where that takes me is those 3,000 people groups who have not explicitly heard the name of Jesus God will judge them perfectly too. God will see each of those individuals and know like, this is the, this is what your life experience was. And I will judge you based on your life experience, not based on Joel's life experience or on Kate, but on this individual. And that gives me hope. Um, and I think that the only thing to be careful with that is like, I don't want to make that absolve me of, of, reaching other people because I think that like what Joel is saying is that knowing Jesus is a, an amazing thing and I wouldn't want to deprive someone of that just because I know that God is a perfect judge very you, well said, Kate thank you this is why when I can't be here, I can't let Kate teach the class because otherwise I'd be out of a job. Um. <laughs> Talk about a better half, Joel. <laughs> I know, right? Go ahead, Sarah. I saw you uh, jump in and then Bob and Peggy. I, I, I agree with what Kate just said because I always go back to Jesus said, no one comes to the Father except through me. But he never specified that you have to do this, and you have to do this, and you have to do this. He says, comes through me. That means we, we use Christ as the image of a, the cross, a bridge between two cliffs. Everyone comes to God by that bridge. And if Jesus is interpreting our lives and seeing his love for us, through that cross. I have no right to judge anything or anybody, and he's the one who's going to present them before God. Faultless and in his glory. So, you know, right. God's got this covered. <laughs> right, Kate? <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you, Sarah. Let's go up to the abbots. Well, you know, I think that it's important to know God, and we must too, if because the invite all to worship God, grow in faith, follow Jesus by serving others. At least the first two items are, you know, grow. You would need to grow in faith if you already knew everything, and to invite all to worship God you would need to be inviting people if they already knew what was going on. I mean, uh, so. Maybe I don't believe the same way some of those people answered today. Well, yeah, it's it's sort of like um, so. I I uh, I will every so often, and this is letting my nerd flag fly a little bit. I'll every so often uh, watch uh, some folks online play this game called Among Us. Uh, if you've not played this game, <laughs> it's it's really quite funny. Um, I've played it with the youth a couple of times. And um, it's, it's fun to watch people play a game. Oh, it's so much more fun though to play it myself. Like, and, and, and that's, that's what I think this is like, uh, at least for me, right? Is it, it can be fun to sort of know of God, right? To, to, to know God a little bit, uh, watch from the sidelines. It is so much more fun uh, to be able to get involved with what God's doing. And I think that there's a difference between the head knowledge that you get, like that, that anybody may have if they go to church here and again, and the heart knowledge and the hands knowledge you get when you're in the game yourself. Um, so I, I don't want to contradict what you're saying, Bob. I think that, you know, yeah, like it, there are some people who are content just with that head knowledge and, you know, their souls are all the poorer for that. 
Um, and as the church, one of the things that we get to be excited about is we get to be God's hands and feet to the world. The two passages that come to mind for me are Romans 2. In Romans chapter 2, Paul talks about how um, people who are without the law, uh, at the end of all things, their hearts will accuse or even excuse them before God, which gets at a little bit, I think, of what Kate was saying. God judges the heart. But then in Romans 10, later on, Paul talks about, um, you know, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. But, but how can those believe if they have not heard? And how can they hear if no one goes to them? And for that reason, it's said how beautiful are the feet that bring good news. Um, so we get the privilege of sharing uh, the, the truth about God with people. Um, and, and I think that there's, there's a, a wisdom in doing that. Um, so I, I think that there's, there's a difference, I think, like I was saying, between just knowing about it and actually doing something with it. And that's, that's what we get to do. And there's a joy in that. Um, I don't know that that answers some of what you were saying, Bob, uh, and you can, of course, feel free to disagree and that's fine. Let's see. Um, there are there are some other pieces to this here that that I I want to make sure that we don't miss before we go, um, and that's the whole idea of the shadow versus the real, right? Just as just as the play kitchen is a shadow of the real kitchen, so too was the sanctuary. Like that was sort of a play kitchen version of the heavenly sanctuary. Uh, and so remember, the whole idea of Hebrews is the supremacy of Jesus Christ. This is the foundation of everything the author is saying. And Jesus is not only a greater high priest, but like when Jesus goes to the kitchen to cook food, he's actually using a real kitchen and is actually cooking real food right? Um, he, he, he's going into the heavenly sanctuary and giving, offering up himself. So it's a real kitchen or a real sanctuary instead of a play sanctuary. And it's a real sacrifice instead of a play sacrifice. And so while I think God looks at us and smiles the same way a parent looks on the three-year-old who is trying to do all these things that adults do and, and doing them cutely and not quite, you know, exactly right, but cutely. I think that God looks at us th that same way, but then Jesus is who actually does the work that we needed to do. Um, that, that we're in the play kitchen and what we do is nice and, 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 and thoughtful, right? But Jesus actually made the main dish that nourishes us. Uh, and I think that's what's going on with the covenant here. Uh, the old covenant was the play kitchen. The new covenant's the real kitchen. So I want to make sure we don't miss that before we, we close our time on Hebrews 8. I think we've got time for, for a couple more thoughts. Uh, and if, if folks want to open up a new can of worms, that's okay too. Uh, and we can, uh, we can have stuff that we think about over the coming week. But any additional thoughts on this? Go ahead, read. Um, just on that judgment uh, issue of who knows the Lord and that sort of thing, um, drawing from our Matthew study, Matthew 7, 21, where it says, or 22, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many deeds of power in your name? And those people didn't get in. And if, if I were judging without that, I'd think, well, yeah, maybe they'd be in front. So, yeah, like your better half said, uh, God's, God's going to do the judgment. Jesus is going to do the judgment. I think it was in First Samuel, right after Samuel anointed David. Uh, God tells Samuel, humans look at outward appearances, but the Lord looks at the heart. 
Um, Reeve and Emily, you unmuted. It may have been because you thought I said Reeve instead of Reed. No, um, no, I, I have one thing that's been hanging with me this whole discussion is prior to Reformation, I thought the priests were the intermediary, intermediary between God and the people. And so back in that earlier period, there had to have been less connectivity with thinking that you could talk to God and hear him and, and truly believe. And I, as I say, it's, it's just a thought I have in my head that we've come a long way since Reformation. I mean, we, we would not have even had a discussion like we're having right now in, in the olden days. Right. Right, the yeah. Bible wouldn't even be in our language. <laughs> oh, the, but but the but the words, whether we they were accessible to us or not, wouldn't they would have been the same back then? So how did they did they just not the the priests just not impart these passages to the common people to get them thinking about knowing God and on a, on a more personal level? I mean, if you imagine it, that would have started a revolution, you know, they would have overthrown the priest and, you know, done Martin Luther's job for him. Well, somehow, I think they would have only talked favorite stories and not gotten into yep. the deeper got, things that we could challenge. We've got Emily, who looks like she's got an answer, and then we'll go up to Dave. Uh, and yes, then we'll uh, one of my dear friends who was uh, so at time pa uh, past at, at Hope grew up Catholic which is what the people you were talking about, the priests and all that. And she said she, as she grew up, was never taught to read the Bible. So uh, she didn't actually start reading the Bible until she was exposed to Presbyterianism. Yeah, there's there's a biblical literacy component there, and and there's also a sense where, well, if Jesus was our intermediary, perhaps we still need intermediaries between us and Jesus, just as Jesus stood between us and God. Um, that may be. I I'm not a Catholic. I can't make that argument. I don't know the 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 Roman Catholic fine points well enough, but but I could see that maybe being a, a thing that said. Dave, um, I saw you raise your hand, uh, and I'm going to give you the last word. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, back to uh, the point that uh, Bunny made about all of these people groups uh, uh, never uh, being exposed to God. Well, unless the unless this earthly realm is here for a long, long time. It doesn't seem possible that everyone will ever be reached. And then when we look back on history, look at all the people groups that were never reached. Look at the judgment that God made himself on these people groups. And we just came out of Exodus and, and look at when they went into the promised land, what did he do? He annihilated all those kingdoms in Canaan. So he had already made judgment on those where did they have an opportunity to know God? You know, it's it's all it's all kind of strange, isn't it? I mean, it's it's the Hebrew people or the chosen people, and it's kind of like everybody else went by the wayside for a while, and then we've hooked on to that graph, so to speak. We're the that we're still Hebrews with a small H, as someone put it. So it's uh, it, it's bewildering to me, uh, and that's one of the reasons a lot of people, I think, don't like the Old Testament, is they read of all of that, and they can't understand how God could annihilate all those people. But again, you, you go back even to, to Noah. <laughs> if it hadn't been for Noah, we wouldn't be here, you know, because he was going to eliminate all of Earth because he was displeased. So I, I don't know. It, it's, a, it's a strange thing, but I think it's... Uh, it's almost, um, I, I can't comprehend the fact that the entire earth will ever hear about our God. They'll hear of a God, because I think it's kind of built in a human psyche to kind of want to know a God, but that doesn't mean it's our God. 
it's not Christ. So I don't know, those are my final words. <laughs> I don't know if, if that made any sense, but I find it very confusing. Thank you, Dave. I, um, I hate ending on confusion, uh, although I do want us to, to think of, of where we may go next from here. Uh, let me, let me actually, if, if you don't mind, Dave, let me give scripture the final word here. Um, because I think that it, it hits at some of what you're saying. And I think that it does give us you know, some, some settling anyway, in my soul, um, toward the end of chapter eight, uh, in, in, in Hebrews, what it says is this, um, and this is what we've been talking about for a good chunk of the time, but I want to give it to you in context. Again, it says they shall not teach one another or say to each other, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest. For I will be merciful toward their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. That's the way that we have been able to know God. And anyone to whom God offers mercy Anyone to whom God offers the, the grace that's common to every human being, the, the joys of life, has an in to knowing God. For the beauty of this day, we give you thanks, O oh God, right? Like even creation sings the praises of Almighty God. Um, so as Paul says, you know, on the one hand, folks are without excuse, but on the other hand, I think that we've all experienced God's mercy. Uh, and and I, I don't want to sell that short either. In what ways have we experienced God's mercy and can know God through that? That's, that's what I'd like for us to consider. Um, because I think that's, that's important. That is how we know God. We can, um, we can talk more about this when we get into chapter nine. That's fine. Uh, this is all kind of one argument. Uh, throughout, you know, from seven all the way through 10. Uh, so we can, we can plug and play, bring stuff back, you know, from previous chapters, etc. So this is not the end of chapter eight, necessarily, even though we'll move on to chapter nine next week. Uh, would somebody be kind enough to close us in prayer? Thank you, Sarah. God. Thank you for bringing us all through the ice storm pretty much in one piece. For those of us who uh, still have things that need to be repaired or fixed or something taken care of, help us to make good decisions. Help us to continue to think about the things that we've read about and discussed tonight and open our hearts and minds to what you want us to know about these things. Um, we're never going to entirely understand, not on this earth, um, but we can trust you uh, to provide some answers so that we can be a little less uncertain. Uh, be with each of those who have been mentioned uh, in prayers this evening, Mark and Deb and, uh, the others, and also for all the silent, unspoken prayer requests uh, that uh, we may have. <clears throat> uh, help us to walk with you and remember that you are always there and that we can rely on you for each step of the way. We pray these things according to your will and your promises in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen.